Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me this Saturday evening to talk about art and technology. Um, before I get started, I um, really do want to acknowledge uh, briefly that um, this is kind of a special moment for me. Um, the wonderful people at BIC have been doing such great work here, and uh, I've been a frequent visitor, so it's really nice to sort of come here and share uh, this body of work with all of you. I see some friends in the audience who have dragged over the years to come with me. Uh, not today, not, I haven't like forced them to come today. Um, so, uh, all right, let's get started. So, uh, do wires dream of veins? Um, this is kind of a framework which I've been thinking of in terms of uh, sort of grounding my work of uh, working with AI machine learning and other emerging technologies like drones, augmented reality, 3D printing over the years to try and sort of get a sense of how the society, uh, how the world we live in is constantly sort of changing and trying to uh, use technology as a means not only for, uh, you know, uh, solving our tasks, etc., but also look at it as a way to um, uh, build more poetic relations now that we are sort of living with it 24-7. So uh, the context, uh, to set some context up, like uh, these are some of the spaces over, over the years where I've sort of spent time uh, working in the art space, um, starting with my bachelor's at Guwahati. Then um, it was really interesting to uh, spend time at the Media Lab, which uh, specifically for the kind of approach that they have to education, something that they called anti-disciplinary approach, which I think really shaped a lot of like early influence in my practice. and some more spaces where I did residencies. And um, in some ways, a result of all this was uh, something like this, right? Like uh, after going through all this, I kind of felt like, uh, okay, I've sort of taken both the pills and I'm conceptually at least like my coordinates are at the intersection of art and technology now. And um, also like even before sort of these institutional spaces like uh, influences early in, on in my life, um, my parents come from diverse backgrounds, so my dad's an engineer, so I would always constantly be told about how physics works, etc. But my mom comes from a literature poetry background, so I always had that influence also. And I sort of, yeah, um, I'm here now talking to all of you about this intersection of art and technology. Um, and uh, to dig a little bit deeper into the context of the framework within a lot of my work sort of pan out uh, would be this sort of post-human kind of framework. And uh, it's already a reality of our times, right? Like um, the fact that none of us could uh, sort of spend uh, a week or even a day without our phones is, uh, is sort of an indication of how critical it is and as an entity to who we are. Um, and uh, in that sense, we have become human machine symbionts. And um, the way sort of I approach this kind of post-human framework is through three uh, sort of points of inquiry, art, playmaking, and tool making, each of which sort of I'll, I'll speak of. And uh, what I mentioned earlier, like the core sort of becomes, can we start building more poetic partnerships with machine learning, AI, or technology in general, rather than just uh, assuming that it is something that just helps us get our tasks done, because it's definitely become much more than that, the amount of influence it has on you, on things you buy, even the people you date, right? So it's, it's really something that, um, that we, need, we need to sort of uh, look at more critically and in a more engaging manner. Um, and it's not to say that uh, definitely the, the time that we are in today uh, calls for this kind of uh, thinking, but also like over the years, uh, the moment of uh, when photography was first introduced had a similar kind of an impact, especially on the art space, right? Till then, in some ways, um, artists had this responsibility to try and capture reality as best as possible. Um, so they would paint portraits, etc. cetera. Uh, but when photography could do that, uh, it kind of liberated artists to uh, become a little bit more open in terms of their interpretation of reality, right? They could uh, sort of, yeah, le led to all these beautiful art movements to happen and they did not really have to stick uh, to the constraints of just getting uh, the representation of reality visually correct or something, right? So, um, and photography by itself also became uh, a visual art form, uh, which is fascinating how technology starts, disrupts a certain kind of 
framework, but then itself sort of also uh, emerges into another medium of expression. And that's the same with um, machine learning AI, right? Like it enables new kinds of uh, creativity to happen um, that other kinds of medium have not allowed till now. So which um, idly will we'll sort of explore through some of the work. So this is an early work that I did, uh, started back actually in 2015. This is from an exhibition we did uh, in Korea in 2018. Um, so this is called the Flying Pantograph. The idea here is to um, around, yeah, around 2014-15, uh, the emergence of drones was starting to happen. There's a lot of like conversation around uh, the politicization of drones, uh, them being used for warfare, etc. cetera. So um, I was very curious, okay, uh, how can we ground that or approach that from a certain different lens, right? Can we approach it from a lens of creative expression or artistic expression? So here basically uh, the drone becomes an extension of the human body. Um, the movements that you do on a desk uh, are mimicked by this flying entity at a remote canvas. And um, it's also interesting, like uh, sort of the dynamics of the drone because it's rubbing against this sort of um, canvas or a whiteboard in this case, there's a certain uh, physics involved in it, which causes a little bit of disruption in the exact copy of the drawings, right? Which invites the human artist to sort of start forming this dialogue with the drone, to try and spend some time with it, get a feeling of how it's responding to you, and then continue this interaction. Um, and it sort of, yeah, lim like the limitations of the human body that you have, it, it frees you from that, um, and you start building sort of this, uh, this dialogue with this new uh, drawing agent. Um, so that was some early work, and then um, that, though it sort of physically augmented um, humans, but uh, the rest of the works are more about uh, more sort of data-based, machine learning-based artworks that, that we'll talk about. Um, so over the last like decade or so, especially, the, the concept of machine learning AI has been around for many, many years, right? Like, in fact, um, with Marvin Minsky's work back in the 50s and 60s, the idea of like trying to develop a computing system was that if you're able to do that um, and if you're able to mimic the human brain it'll give us a good sense of uh, an insight into how the brain works right so the idea of um, making artificially intelligent systems has always been around and in some ways the core like uh, theoretical algorithmic concepts have also been around to try and study the neural networks of the brain and try and mimic that in some capacity but what has changed over the last 10, 15 years roughly has been uh, this advent of the internet and therefore leading to tons of data that each of our digital footprint is now tracked and stored in massive databases, servers, right? And uh, the other thing is uh, how compute has become much more cheaper and faster. So you had room sized sort of compute systems at some point which fit into your hand uh, these days, right? And it's made computing a lot more democratized, a lot more easily accessible. And uh, the capturing of data also sort of the political nature of it, like allowing people to be surveilled or things of that nature, create incentives for uh, companies, for individuals to try and make sense of that data. So there's both economical as well as technological sort of uh, and political powers at play in terms of sort of creating this kind of AI revolution that we are seeing today. Uh, to briefly touch upon how most of the fundamental like structures uh, within modern day AI work. So we have what are called neural networks. The idea is um, you give it examples of lots of images of a certain type and it's able to start making patterns of how a cat looks or how a dog looks. So in sort of abstracting it out a bit, like the idea of perception starts to happen, like people are able or machines are able to start perceiving the world around them. And in some ways, uh, mimicking, let's say how we also create, like we've gotten a lot of input that we've uh, had. And if we sort of flip that narrative in a way, we, we start like responding to the world, we start creating things out of that. So uh, pretty much uh, if I were to like give a two slide like summary of how you would think machines could start being creative visually, this would be it, right? Like you start teaching the machines about the world and you start in some ways um, 
reversing that process to start letting the machines create something from what they've learned. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, around 2015, when uh, the idea of this sort of deep neural network was starting to emerge, uh, I did this work uh, called uh, Tandem, which is basically a drawing system. You draw something and the machine uh, interprets that drawing and redraws that in some interesting ways. So what most of us would think of as sort of trees, uh, leafless trees in a deserted land, that's the human input on the left, which gets sort of treated as these dogs with large ears. So it became really fascinating for me that in some ways for the first time, you're not having a dialogue of, okay, like make my circle better or like straighten my line or something, right, with the machine, but you're really starting to have a creative dialogue with the machine where it's reinterpreting your inputs in ways that you probably hadn't imagined. So um, just playing a small video of how the system works. So yeah, this is again back in uh, 2015, 2016 days where you do a random scribble and it sort of interprets that scribble as let's say a car or a bird and, and certain other entities, right? And so it becomes like a playful experience to for you to uh, start like having some kind of a relation with this machine learning uh, sort of mammoth that we always keep hearing about, right? And uh, becomes a way for you to have some kind of an inquiry into this system's uh, mind and uh, interpretations. Uh, so it was really interesting for me as an artist, especially for these works uh, uh, to be shown at different places, but also particularly like to become part of um, the permanent collection of the largest science museum in the world. Uh, computer science museum in the world, which was interesting because really sort of indicating this coming together of um, the two worlds in a, in a very um, strong manner. Um, and often like uh, when I talk about machine learning and art, AI and art, a lot of people ask, okay, um, so it's, it's all sort of abstract and uh, there is no materiality in it. But in some ways, like this is a loose analogy, but uh, an analogy that I think works sort of to draw uh, in earlier times, like artists would use, uh, paint as as the material and use paint brushes to manipulate that material into a painting in some ways for me uh, data becomes that raw material and algorithms become sort of that paint brush to manipulate that data into something and um, a, an example of an artwork that sort of indicates this is this work called strange genders that uh, uh, we did in 2020 uh, this was sort of an inquiry into thinking, okay, uh, now that we have the capacity of machine learning models to learn on large visual data sets, right? Can we uh, start uh, poking at this question of what people of India think of gender visually? So uh, what we started doing is collecting drawings from people going to lot of, lots of people uh, in Bangalore, uh, asking them to draw their uh, understanding of a standing female form and a standing male form. So this is a, what, a representation of what people drew for female figures. And this by itself is really fascinating to look at, right? Like the breadth of uh, kind of uh, interpretations and visualizations that people have. This is for um, the standing male figure. Um, and then we sort of continued this exercise online uh, through Mechanical Turk uh, because the pandemic started. Um, and then fed all this data into an AI system, um, particularly generative adversarial networks. So, uh, for it to start like uh, learning some of these distinctions between the drawings that people have drawn. So this is just sort of a sampling of some of the drawings that it was able to reproduce um, by learning across the system. And um, so basically there were two sort of AI systems at play here, one to generate new stick figure drawings and another one to give it some kind of a classification score that uh, this new AI generated stick figure what percentage female is that drawing based on the original data set that it was fed. Um, and it's really fascinating, like beginning from the sort of binary construct uh, of these male female inputs, um, you got a spectrum of uh, outputs out, right? So this is how we sort of ultimately um, uh, created uh, sort of these canvases out of that where the central figure denotes sort of a 100% female, um, entity that uh, the machine has created and and labeled on its own. And the outermost radius is sort of the 0% uh, uh, female uh, figures. Uh, so sort of, yeah, it this is in some ways an example of thinking of something like this kind of an artwork 
wouldn't be possible without uh, humans or the machines, right? Like without them working together, because um, we do not have uh, the capacity to sort of uh, learn uh, visual patterns across thousands of images in a, in a way to sort of recreate them. Uh, but the input that is fed to the machines is through the human. So both of them really coming together to sort of uh, create this work. And those are the things that I find at least quite interesting. Like what are the new forms of creative expression that are now possible given that we have these machine learning systems in place. Um, and yeah, this was shown at different places, including sort of at Imami Art in 21 in Calcutta. This is another project that I did. This is also somewhat of an early work uh, in 2018 called uh, The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Algorithm. Um, and this work was very much inspired uh, by one of Rembrandt's early paintings called uh, The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Talp, which uh, Rembrandt had also uh, done when he was 26. And somehow I had also done this work when I was 26, I think some kind of existential questions start happening around that time. But uh, it was very interesting for me to think that, OK, um, Rembrandt had obviously done this work back in the day when surgeries was just starting to happen, right? And uh, he was fascinated by this thinking that um, uh, should humans be allowed to cut open other humans? And uh, in some ways, we are in that parallel era of our troubled fascination in some ways with AI machine learning at least six, seven years ago, uh, where we are starting to think, okay, how much of human knowledge, et cetera, should be exposed to the machine. So uh, I'd done this work where I'd taken basically uh, about 60,000 images of surgical dissections and uh, trained a machine to try and reinterpret them uh, in these more vivid flower-like images. Not all of them, some of them were from that uh, sort of uh, thinking some others from another kind of thinking, but these were sort of the outputs generated from that, which uh, uh, which was also a uh, shout out to Nature Mod for sort of doing this show back in 2018, which became actually um, the world's first like AI art show in a contemporary gallery uh, across the world, which was very interesting. Um, this other work that I uh, wanted to talk through um, is called Mass Reality. This is an interactive work. Uh, what happens here is an audience face uh, is transformed into uh, uh, these two uh, performance forms, Thayyam and Kathakali, in real time. So uh, basically, uh, someone stands in front of uh, a digital screen which has a camera input, and your face is sort of tracked, recognized, its contours, etc. And uh, there's and there's two AI models actually that are trained on each of these performance forms separately that sort of transform your face into these two um, entities. And uh, this again is sort of an early work from around 2018. Um, and the thinking around this work, um, I mean, there's a, a lot of conversation around uh, the use of cameras for surveillance and for sort of um, in some ways, predictive policing and, and things of that nature. Um, and uh, things that sort of perpetuate bias further, right? And um, in some ways, for me, it was uh, interesting to look at, okay, can I use that same technology of facial structural understanding uh, to maybe ground that technology in a different context? And I mean, two contexts in some ways, one very, very much about also infusing uh, Global South Indian sort of aesthetics in the world of AI art, especially back then, uh, there were not a lot of people sort of talking about uh, uh, aesthetics from the East, right? Like there was a lot of conversation of the digital archives that exist of the West, etc. But also like starting to think, okay, how can we contribute to that conversation? Um, but also here. Um, taking that uh, sort of facial recognition technology. And actually, this is uh, me on one side and the the output on the other. But in the actual like uh, exhibition of this work, uh, what happens is you see yourself simultaneously as both these uh, forms. And uh, it's interesting to juxtapose these two because uh, traditionally, there's been a divide in how uh, these performance rituals or performance forms have been 
uh, carried out by people, right? The, in terms of uh, societal distinctions between who is allowed to perform what. And in some ways here using machine learning AI to kind of collapse that boundary where every individual sees themselves embodying themselves as both of these uh, performances uh, simultaneously. So uh, again, like, can we start thinking of um, AI ML um, and create new lenses of engaging with it to sort of um, create um, new entry points to, you know, maybe disrupt things of the past, but also in a way that allows people to have more personal, more direct, engaging, interactive experiences with it. Um, and yeah, some static works from that same series of masked reality, masked identities, and the idea of masks will keep coming back because it's something that I'm actually quite fascinated by. It's, it's, it's an entity that allows you to transform your identity in some ways, right? And step into some different kind of realms, but it, the idea of masks comes back through, comes to us uh, in some ways through filters of uh, digital filters that or some kind of digital identities that in some ways we hide ourselves behind today. So really sort of trying to uh, bring those two uh, thoughts together. And um, yeah, I'll talk about that a bit more, some of the future works. Um, this uh, work called uh, Unstill Life was, uh, I did this last year primarily, started a bit before that. Uh, but uh, I was also very interested, I, I do have like, come from a tech, tech background also, right? And sort of art and tech really uh, go back and forth for me. Like, so there's also um, in terms of thinking, okay, uh, as someone engaging with this technology, can I uh, think of it more from a computer vision lens where I say, can I teach the machine uh, the conceptual distinction between the compositional and the painterly in some ways saying that, okay, I have this uh, beautiful data set of uh, still life paintings. Uh, but can I create a system where uh, the machine uh, focuses on zoomed in parts from that data set uh, for one of its learning journeys and focuses on the entire compositions for another of its learning journeys? And then can I sort of uh, collapse those two in some ways to say, okay, um, um, can you start from sort of abstract and go to more compositional and back to painterly and abstract and more compositional and sort of create that looping kind of uh, framework out of that. Um, so this is this is an outcome of that, that sort of technical exploration and artistic aesthetic exploration. So here really trying to see, okay, we have sort of this aesthetic of still life paintings for hundreds of years, right? But how can a new technology that we have at play um, uh, help us sort of really uh, poke at that from a very different kind of inquiry? So uh, yeah, this sort of just, just keep sort of looping and also very interesting for me to vary like when when you sort of think of ai art it it often becomes like this abstract thing there's no like i was saying no materiality within it but in some ways the craft of for me as an ai artist is these entities right like the data sets and the algorithms like for here for example like to train it on um, the compositional kind of outputs i would uh, sort of uh, let the machine learn more slowly um, in some ways, there's parameters to sort of adjust that and to train on the more uh, painterly, more abstract, I would like let it train faster, right? So it would sort of learn larger brush strokes, more painterly kind of works rather than the details of a compositional output. So it really becomes interesting for me to start thinking from that framework, like that becomes in some ways the craft of the AI artist. Um, and uh, also, I mean, a lot of times, like, people wonder, like, okay, this looks nice and interesting, but uh, if I were to hang it on my wall, right, like the traditional question, um, how would I do that? So it's also very interesting that just uh, as, as a space, as an industry, in, in, in so to say, uh, there have been a lot of, like, new innovations in terms of displays, et cetera, that allow you to show digital art and maintain the... Uh, visual aesthetics of it right rather than like having cut corners on a tv etc or the tv jutting out of the wall etc so um infinite objects is one of them and really beautifully crafted uh, displays and you just sort of put the video on there's no like hdmi usb etc and it sort of just plays right um so it's it's really interesting like across sort of these uh forms um uh, 
be it displays, be it uh, processors, etc. There is a conversation of digital art, AI art happening uh, within within the entire spectrum. Uh, from the same series of uh, the still lives, um, created this work, uh, which was more of a form study of creating 3D printed um, sculptural forms. So uh, from that same process, sort of abstracted some uh, stills and then sculpted them in 3D to then 3D print them. Uh, so again, also thinking of different kinds of manifestations of something that is a digitally native practice. Uh, uh, all right, so uh, this next work um, uh, called Authorize uh, was very interesting for me for also the kind of like interactions people had with it and the feedback that I got about it. Um, it's, it's a writing system uh, where um, you start writing something um, and it's, it's like this pen with which you start writing, but after 15 seconds, the pen nib retracts and then basically you are uh, kind of a robotic arm for the machine. You just hold this pen and you let the machine uh, write its thoughts uh, using you as the, as the robot or like sort of that flip of agency happens where uh, you are no longer the thinking entity in this relationship. Uh, you just become sort of um, this mechanical arm for the machine to write. And uh, how this works is, uh, is there's, there's a visual system that tracks the initial input that you give um, and also then sort of passes that through an AI system that's trained on books of uh, poetry and philosophy. And then basically there's a 2D plotter under the table surface, uh, which has a magnet attached to it and the machine generates some writing. And this is like pre pre chat GPT era, right? So, this was specifically trained to generate sort of these uh, interesting or abstract, interesting kind of outputs. Like, uh, so here the person started by writing freedom of man is, and then sort of through the machine continued to write a myth who is a moral and a nice person of the state to say the truth. So yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. Maybe uh, it's more interesting after a few rounds of drinks. I don't know, but, um, uh, but I found this really fascinating because whenever um, I showed this work and um, sort of what I would do is also ask the audience to um, to tell me if they felt that this piece of paper, this piece of writing that actually emerged belonged to them or belonged uh, to the AI system, right? And oftentimes there would be complete sort of ownership that they would feel of this writing, even though they've literally spent like uh, 10 minutes just holding a pen and doing nothing else. Uh, so there, and maybe this has sort of evolved over the years, but there is this sort of very deep rooted uh, uh, thinking that humans are at the center of each of our interactions with digital machines, right? Even, uh, even though a lot of the things that actually happen on digital systems are uh, highly curated sort of uh, movements from large tech companies that know or are able to influence sort of your next decisions on these systems, right? So in some ways, like if we can make that experience uh, very physical, like sort of this, this project pushes that to an extreme where your hand itself starts becoming controlled uh, in the context of something very simple, like writing a piece of paper, uh, right? Writing some text on a piece of paper. So using that sort of extreme scenario to try and uh, invite people to rethink that relationship that they have with technology and maybe start engaging more critically and more thoughtfully with it. Um, and yeah, like one of the manifestations of that work was at this sort of large wall that we did. Uh, it's part of my first solo show back in 21, which was India's first solo show of AI art and was really interesting also Shout out to Maina Mukherjee, who was the curator of that show, um, and for Imami to sort of uh, uh, make this happen in some ways, because I think conversations around digital art, uh, around technology-based art are now starting to emerge in the Indian context. And I think it's really important to start pushing that, because obviously, like as a country, we create a lot of data, we create a lot of technology, but uh, how much do we like really dig into it, right? Um, and this was another work that I, uh, the, this work was shown as this sort of large wall, uh, about uh, 10 feet by 30 feet wall 
Um, and each of these columns actually represent a, a basic phrase, like this is black, this is white, and some more like uh, slightly abstract phrases, which I'll show in the next slides. Uh, this work was born out of this um, sort of um, like very old framework or debate that you had around platonic forms, right? Like um, the idea of platonic realism um, is the view that universals are real entities in the sense that the concept of redness, roundness, there, there are some ideal forms of this that exist. And uh, if you see a red ball or something that is sort of a particular instance of that ideal form. And uh, those forms like do not physically exist, so to say, but there is a space in which like a universal metaphysical space where they exist, but sort of all the uh, objects that we see in our reality are instances of that ideal form. So um, it was very interesting, like this is obviously conceptually like, uh, like a framework. It's fascinating to think of it, think of entities this way. And what became interesting for me is to think, okay, now that we have the ability to actually for the first time in some sense, make sense of millions of images at once, right? Can I use that to try and poke at this question of, is there a universal understanding of themes, right? Like, so um, there is a particular data set that Microsoft has released called uh, Coco. It's uh, common objects in context. And it's about, if I remember correctly, about 15 million images which have been labeled by people. So every like random people on the internet have given five labels to each image. Um, and then what I was able to do is sort of um, query that data set to try and create these images of certain concepts. Like, okay, this is, if I give it an input, like this is black, this is the kind of abstract output that it produces, which kind of makes sense. There's a bit of white to show the black and uh, vice versa in the input, this is white. And then these became sort of those columns that you saw earlier. But also like very interesting to think of it for slightly more abstract concepts, right? Like this is last, this is load. And in some ways, um, it, it kind of shows that, I mean, like in some ways it shows that sort of universal uh, visualization of a particular like abstract concept that we have as humanity, right? Just because of the ability for us to be able to poke at this through AI machine learning now. Um, all right, so uh, this this next artwork that I want to talk about is it's called Landing Page. It's it's actually a virtual reality artwork. What happens here is um, you put on these VR headsets and you land on this sort of space. This is actually a poppy plantation. Um, and as you start moving around, you realize that everything in this space is made up of these videos. And these videos are actually um, advertisements on which like most money was spent on Facebook over the last two years. Um, so this work really starts poking at this uh, theme which we're starting to see uh, or over the last eight, 10 years I've been seeing of data colonialism, right? Like, like a new form of colonization to emerge. And we had uh, uh, Mr. Amitav Ghosh speak here uh, some weeks ago and in his book, uh, or The Sea of Poppies and his recent book, like he talks a lot about how uh, the idea of poppies has been um, uh, such a core, like uh, in some way enabler of colonization to happen, right? Like those uh, plantations led to the revenues that uh, Britishers could use to sort of lead to uh, colonial uh, uh, sort of infiltration. And in some ways that's exactly what is happening today with, uh, with data and machine learning, right? So uh, advertisements become that channel for us to in some ways uh, for companies to sort of earn revenues to continue influencing us over the years. Um, and it's also very interesting uh, for me when I was doing research for this work to like uh, look at Facebook's API and think of, okay, get data about what uh, are actually sort of the most, uh, you know, uh, paid for ads in, in what we consume. And, a lot of it happened to be, or not happened to be, but are political ads or ads of political nature, right? So there is that sort of multi-layered, in some ways, data colonization that that is subliminally happening, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, this this work was sort of a response to that. So you basically um, can walk around and sort of get a closer view of all of these uh, uh, ads that that you are actually being targeted with, and. Uh, uh, this work, the other thing that I want to talk about this work, actually, I did a version of this work 
on a metaverse land called Decentraland, uh, which was uh, which was interesting for me also because I mean there's this whole like conversation around the metaverse becoming this sort of free space, but also with uh, large tech companies like Meta investing so heavily on it, how much of that would actually play out is is to be seen. So this had shown at um, at an exhibition last year at the Habitat Center. Um, okay, this next work um, also thinks of. Um, of spaces, but also sort of the political narratives that are built around spaces today. Um, and the work um, basically reimagines the Humayu's tomb, which uh, basically a photograph of the Humayu's tomb as this alternate kind of architectural space, right? And uh, in some ways, uh, what is important in some ways to start thinking about is that Though this is a very abstracted sort of visualization uh, to sh sort of show that transformation happening gradually and not to really do it in a photorealistic way uh, on purpose, but the idea of this kind of AI based manipulation is very much a reality of our times right and that really leads us to start questioning that what is real what is not and what becomes the reality of people is what is consumed through digital channels in some sense and then. Uh, the the power that those sort of visuals have uh, to create narratives right so in some ways uh becoming mindful of that at least so that we don't uh consume without sort of that uh, second thought i think is really important in some ways um i think a fundamental shift in how we actually consume digital material is needed uh we generally like what we see we believe right but in some ways we have to start thinking of it from uh, especially digital content that we consume like don't believe until you verify it like that kind of a uh, an opposite shift in thinking i think is something that um, ai machine learning systems are like uh, forcing us to start doing and i think it's important to collectively sort of engage so some of these works to to, to poke at that kind of um, uh, reality in some ways um, okay, so this next work, uh, this is a video. This is about a three minute, 40 second video and it has audio too. So I'll not talk over it. I'll just let it play, but I, I just want to give some context before I start playing this. Uh, so this is a work called the garden of digital delights. And, uh, it was very much inspired from the garden of earthly delights, a really beautiful, uh, famous painting by Bosch, um, I think really back in the day. But uh, the idea of, I think, delight in today's times is also very interesting to start thinking of what is uh, digital delight for us as sort of these uh, like constant consumption of social media content, etc. And it's sort of, yeah, like a framework for entities to keep us hooked onto just mindless scrolling. And while we are doing that become sort of agents of consuming ads, etc. Right. So uh, this work sort of started from that thinking that what is the idea of digital delights today? And it basically is, is a work that I showed on a large cube, a seven and a half feet uh, cube structure, uh, LED cube structure, which I'll show in the next slide. And each of the four sites sort of talk about four different gardens uh, emerging over time and all of them sort of going through this journey of, uh, of how uh, they they start with this garden, but sort of converge into data centers, newsrooms, filter bubbles. Uh, and the one on the left bottom uh, garden, that's that's the one that talks about sort of also the labor involved in a garden, like building of a garden. So we often think of AI, we think of this sort of uh, uh, entity that just sort of magically works, right? But there's millions and millions of people like labor labor in fact in some ways sort of labeling data uh, like uh, making sure that uh, the content we consume on the internet is uh, safe to consume and people are sort of sitting screening that content day in and day out um, so there is a lot of like human cost involved in maintaining the infrastructures of ai systems so yeah this this work sort of these this four-sided work kind of talks about that so the right side cube will slowly keep rotating and the uh, left ones will just show each of the four surfaces of the videos. Uh, yeah.
ends with this white cube to sort of a little bit of a pun on a white cube in a white cube gallery. But uh, uh, this is this is actually how it uh, was manifested in in, a, in the physical space. So this is sort of that cube structure uh, with the four sided video. And uh, what was really like uh, very like interesting and I think special moment in some ways for me was to uh, observe this little person like uh, uh, they spend almost like 40 45 minutes just walking around the cube and and looking at what's happening and uh, yeah it, it i think uh, it was really nice to see that um so yeah this was earlier this year in delhi um this other work also before i play this video again this has some audio to it uh, not not as loud as the last one but uh, uh, this work is coming back to the thinking around masks, right? So um, uh, we all have probably used uh, Instagram filters, social media filters uh, on our phones, and that sort of is a playful interaction. It changes the way we look. Um, it adds a certain humor. But there's also like uh, an, an sort of a slightly uglier side to it in some ways, right? Where uh, they sort of are creating some norms of beauty standards, etc., that are now starting to become uh, a lot more, have a lot more influence on how we think about ourselves. And uh, there have been a lot of reports about the number of um, uh, surgeries, etc., or some kind of medical procedures that people are undergoing as a result of sort of engagement with these. And again, like thinking back about masks, masks as an entity, as a cultural form have existed for thousands of years across cultures like it's fascinating how every culture has some kind of ways of sort of transformation right of transcending the reality that we live in um but uh, in some ways if you look at these sort of contemporary masks uh, it's maybe moving from a more uh, uh, transcendent lens to a more like public gaze in some way so this work basically looks at sort of these two forms and this video is a very slowly morphing video so kind of like uh, pay attention to the face in some ways and we'll talk about it after
Okay, I'm a photographer. Like, uh, I have a commercial studio. And this is why these filters are bullshit, because people use them so much that this is what they think they actually look like. These filters have messed with our brains so much that people honestly think this is what they look like. This filter is insane. Like, look, it's, it's so real. So then when I take someone's photo and say, I show them the back of the camera and they look like this, they're devastated. They're devastated. The amount of times I hear a beautiful woman tell me how disgusting and how ugly they are. Oh, look at their wrinkles, look how old. They use these filters and that's their baseline. So yeah, TikTok came out with this uh, filter called Bold Glamour, I think two, three months ago. And I saw some of these videos uh, and it's quite disturbing, honestly, like uh, of the just also being in the field of AI machine learning. I know you can track faces, you can do stuff to it, but this kind of like realism without it flickering at all with occlusions, etc. in front, like it's it's yeah, it's uh, beyond sort of that uh, fun to play with kind of space. Right. And I think, uh, yeah, that got me started to starting to think a bit about like sort of what are these forms of identity transformation and how we've engaged with it over over centuries and could that be a way to start like thinking about this a bit um okay so uh moving from like a lot of these art projects but also like um i did a curatorial project a couple of years ago uh for this platform called terrain.art which is an uh, a digital art nft kind of platform uh sister platform to the nature mod gallery and curated a show called intertwined intelligences with these wonderful like ai artists international artists so just showing some of the works uh, from there uh, this is sophia crespo and entangled others work so they created these uh bugs uh, or just alternate life forms um and the the whole show the thought behind the show was to take sort of these uh physical realities in some way and how artists have sort of reimagined it through uh, AI machine learning. And uh, they created these and then they'd also like created this very fun Instagram filter to go on like a walk with uh, these characters, right? Um, and Scott Eaton's work of like uh, looking at human form and how uh, uh, Scott Eaton basically photographs a lot of people in motion um, uh, and he comes from a photo photography kind of practice. Uh, but then he took those photographs and started creating these really fluid uh, alternate human forms, right? So he would sketch out these forms and let an AI system kind of uh, reimagine that sketch into this human entity or human-like entity. Um, uh, I showed some works around landscape series that I'd done to create sort of real, semi-real kind of landscape moving uh, video works. Um, okay, so from sort of that like early on i sort of mentioned these three frameworks of engaging with uh the post-human in some ways right the art which all of this was about the art so there's also works in terms of play how can we engage more playfully with uh, culture with data etc uh, so as part of a residency that uh, i've been doing with google arts and culture um i've been looking at sort of matchbox labels of india and trying to create an interactive experience around that, which lets you uh, like just explore these fascinating like visuals, right? And learn a bit about them and also like build. So the, the thinking around uh, the game in some ways that we're building is, can you go on a collector's journey to collect sort of these labels and ultimately like based on those labels, uh, an AI generated artwork is is made that sort of becomes part of your collection also. So it's more uh, to think of, okay, um, most of us are like sort of digital people nowadays. Can we bring cultural artifacts into a space of, uh, of, of where we are today, right? Of sort of digital realities and create more fun, just playful ways of, of exploring that, of engaging with that. So you basically start playing around. You have this little character that goes on this journey um it uh, moves you around this board and you land on some of these collected bazaars like the chore bazaar etc and this sort of quiz opens up where you have to try and match the cutout the right cutout with the right like matchbox label and obviously a lot of this happens with 
the use of technology at the back end, right? To try and create these sort of uh, um, these actual quiz uh, cards, etc. Uh, so this sort of continues. This is a uh, work in progress coming out soon. So it will be part of the Google Arts and Culture um, app. But also very fascinating for me to then take these visual materials and uh, um, work with uh, the original collectors of it to try and create uh, some kind of machine learning based reinterpretations, right? So these are some samples of Matchbox labels uh, taking the base sort of visual aesthetic, but creating new works out of that. And it's also just been a fascinating journey for me to just go through this collection uh, and you find such interesting things, right? Like on the top left, you see the word guitar, like guitar spelled as guitar, because back in the day, like uh, there used to be thinking around copyright. And what was happening was a lot of this was being produced at a very localized center, right, in, in Tamil Nadu. So everyone knew what other people are creating, but uh, they also wanted to keep what is working, but change it a bit. So they would probably misspell the word or something and sort of get away with uh, copyright claims, etc. So um, really interesting to also look at sort of um, cultural artifacts and start thinking of instead of it being a binary conversation where you either you just sort of digitize it and put it up and don't really create meaningful playful engagements with it how can you start thinking of it from a more uh, fun engaging manner in some ways so another sort of project this is a continuation of the mass reality work that i'd shown earlier so working with a chutti artist who actually paints the faces of kathakali dancers to create these uh, um, like paintings and then use them as uh, digital artifacts for like uh, building and pardon my bad acting skills, but like, yeah, create these sort of digital mask uh, uh, layers. Uh, so the idea with this is to actually uh, like uh, progressively show these layers with sort of the music of Kathakali in the background. Uh, and really interesting to work with the artist also because uh, I went up to him and said that, okay, I want uh, the, the face tracking system and the way this technology is going to work is I need to have these like square uh, paintings, right? And he was like, I paint on faces, like how do I paint on paper and especially these square ones? So like it was a nice conversation and then um, we worked together, created some digital like um, sort of references, et cetera, to, to work and get, get these outputs. So I think it's interesting to start thinking of how can we sort of marry uh, these worlds in some ways, instead of thinking, okay, we are just gonna like have uh, in some ways a digital sort of art movement that is separate from what already exists, right? Uh, this next project is more of an art experiment uh, in terms of thinking about uh, uh, this new generative AI uh, kind of era that we are in, uh, where you can sort of write text and generate visual outcome from it. Um, and pardon me for sort of all the graphic designers in this room, uh, if you're gonna have like a bad time looking at this, but this is a very like major reality of India especially, right? Like the number of good morning messages that are sent out every day. Uh, it's some 100 crore good morning messages and it sort of has clogged the internet many a time. So it's a really fascinating sub visual subculture that is at play. So I was very curious and obviously like I'm part of WhatsApp groups where these messages also come like family groups, etc. right? So um, I was very curious, okay, can I create some, something where uh, for example, like my parents, right? Like they wouldn't go on a Discord server to go on mid journey to create something uh, uh, that they want to create. I, I don't see that happening at all. Uh, but they do consume this kind of content day in and day out and they forward it to as many people as they possibly can. Um, so I was like, okay, let me try and like think of it from somewhat of an artist's lens. So could I, um, sorry about that, Microsoft. Um, but um, yeah, so I created this system where uh, with a couple of friends where you could sort of send a message and get like messages, visual uh, creations back within WhatsApp. And uh, it's kind of solved uh, for my parents, at least the good morning, like where do we find this and how do we forward it, etc. But it's created a lot more messages coming in for me from them, which I don't know if it's 
a good thing or a bad thing but um, but sort of keeping like it's an interesting project for me also to think of okay it's I, I can't think of it as a completely new visual language also because there is a visual language that they are used to that they work within and uh, can i sort of get get to that but also create like uh, an easy framework for them to sort of you know take part in this kind of generative ai creative uh, revolution so to say that we are witnessing right um, so this was a very nice moment for me just a couple of days ago uh, uh, so dad runs also like a, a group in the society that we live in around uh, uh, tree plantation etc so he was like okay i proposed to see so he created this with untool and he was like i proposed to send this as a message and i don't know why like dad especially are so formal on whatsapp also but um, but it was really nice like he was able to like marry these two interests in some ways right like his interest of um, environmental practices but the independence day message that he wanted to send so i yeah like i mean even i or none of us would have actually been able to in some ways create this with uh, that kind of uh, instant sort of output right so there is a power that generative ai obviously unlocks and so can we think of like sort of extending that uh, beyond the frameworks within which it works today um and uh, my aunt like um, a very like uh, sweetly always asks me to create like birthday cards etc for um uh, our nephew or like other people in the family and i was like okay maybe uh, you can try like sol like using this to solve that in some way so if she writes something like birthday cake car ki shape mein, which translates to yeah birthday cake in the form of a car for kian uh, which is um, our nephew's name so it, it prints like it gives out sort of this visual right and it's it's something that she can then immediately use which is fascinating uh, and uh, also, yeah, I've been sort of having fun with it. Like, uh, uh, if I have to make plans with someone, I instead of just asking or writing that plan, I'm like, okay, I'll create some visual with it. And it's sort of that friction less way of creation because it's all happening within WhatsApp. So, what was actually very interesting, and this is an anecdote I wanted to share with this group, is uh, I asked my mom to also use it, and um, she obviously creates a lot of like good morning, like not creates, like sends a lot of good morning messages around uh, religion, right? And so, um, so she created these two that you see on the left, and I, I was also quite like uh, pleasantly surprised that yeah, that's a decent outcome for the kind of biased data sets that these actually rely on, right? Uh, but she was completely like. Uh, upset like she just she was like beta you have to stop doing all this and i was like what happened she's like i mean you you look at that like you can't like have such kind of a treatment right of uh of uh, religious figures and i was like uh, oh my, like i didn't kind of realize how sensitive that particular topic is and when we all like talk about ai machine learning and we're sort of glorifying its capabilities i think it's really important to also be mindful of where that might actually be needed and where it might not be needed so how basically we sort of uh, did a work around for untool is actually give real images itself instead of for religious entities for now and this is very much like a, a passion kind of project artwork that's happening so it's obviously not like uh, fail proof or anything but uh, but really interesting sort of insights emerging of how uh, and for for my mom, it doesn't really matter, right? Like if if an AI generated it or not. Like it's like you give me the image that works for me. Uh, don't like sell me the story that millions of images were used to train this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, I think um, this is. If any one of you want to play around with it, I'll pause for a second. This is basically like the WhatsApp number or the QR code leads to that uh, WhatsApp chat interface, and you can just just type in a message, send it, and it returns like an image and um so uh we touched upon this idea of like the post-truth a bit earlier and uh, sort of coming back to that a bit uh um there's this really interesting project that this artist did where he created a camera which works without a lens um uh, uh, so uh when you click this it sort of takes instead of like capturing photons it sort of captures the like reality from the sensors built into the camera of where you are taking this picture from and it sort of recreates an image uh, using generative 
AI. Um, and um, it's really fascinating of how accurate the images come out to be generally, but also interesting to think of if this, these were done in, let's say, a context in a rural village in India, would the image have been that accurate, right? Um, so in some ways, I think it's, it's, I'll skip these two slides because we're running a bit short in time, but I think it's really, really important to start thinking of AI not as this sort of abstracted, like non-tangible kind of entity that just does something, right? But really start poking at what are the components of this material in some ways. There are two major components, data sets, algorithms, they pretty much shape how AI works. And those components have far reaching consequences, right? Like the data that actually gets fed into an AI, uh, what, like who gets included, what are the biases that creep in, uh, how do you ensure privacy data that is collected is from consent from people, what is created with it is, is a direct result of the data set. Algorithms, how can we make that a lot more transparent? How can we expose sort of their parameters a lot more to people? How can people build causality from these par uh, algorithms, etc.? So I think it really becomes a question, especially as artists, creative folks, to start thinking of can we build frameworks so that we more and more people are able to participate in this uh, conversation, right? And uh, just two, three slides to sort of end, we've uh, kind of seen this sort of generative AI revolution where you type in a prompt and you get really fascinating like visual outcomes, which is great. But also to maybe dig deeper into this, like I think uh, uh, Rilke put it beautifully back in the day where he says that things are not, um, all as graspable and sable as on the whole we are led to believe. Most events are unsable, occur in a shape, in a space that no word has ever penetrated, and most unsable of all are works of art, mysterious existences whose life endures alongside ours, which us. So just this idea of okay, like there is obviously a huge unlock that text to image sort of frameworks have, but there there are deeper kind of uh, deeper kind of questions, deeper kind of feelings that we all uh, encompass and work with, right? So I think we have to be just a bit mindful of, of not reducing that into sort of this, uh, this singular kind of framework. And uh, in some ways, some other like philosophical thinking around this is like, Peter sees the computer, but the machine only creates what humans have taught it to, Peter says, and his mom says that, so do you. So there's also sort of this thinking that our humans and the creativity that we embody Anyway, in that sense, maybe not maybe that special after all, right? So um, I think having sort of an open mind to all those kind of thinkings and actively like discussing them becomes important. And this is something that I like to say when people ask, like, have we finally automated creativity? So I think that's a very like, uh, uh, very, again, binary approach to look in some ways, like I, I feel AI has the same potential to automate creativity as the existence of cars has to automate walking. And uh, this very fascinating Twitter exchange before I finish, um, uh, back in the day when Twitter was still functional and not like an X entity, but it was like um, this particular researcher in the space said, it may be that today's large neural networks are slightly conscious, to which another researcher replied in the same sense that it may be that a large field of wheat is slightly pasta. Uh, so I'll leave you with that note. And thank you very much for sticking around. Hey, hey Harshit, the talk was very fascinating. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, my question is about um, the creativity aspect. So how would the creativity be redefined through AI? Yeah, I think uh, it, it really is up to, I think, the human like involved in the creative process to uh, bring that out in some ways. Like um, if you're able to uh, work with it as sort of like a material, right? Like which I keep, coming back to if you're able to think of it as this uh, entity that is made up of data sets algorithms and how you can bring your own creative expression using th those particular properties of this AI material. So 
I think it really becomes that as the as the creative process for a human to deal or engage with an AI, uh, rather than treating it as this black box that just does some magic. Right, a related question, like because as programmers, right, we like they think more more algorithmic. Okay, so would they need to think more fuzzy, and uh, how is it spanning up? Yeah, I mean. Uh, it really depends like uh, what you exactly want to do if you're if you're curious to like really engage with the algorithmic layer then yeah you sort of start poking at it from that angle if you're more curious to engage from like the data layer then you start like engaging from that lens so i think it really becomes important as to what the human wants to like do out of this if there's a certain Thing that they want to like comment about through this they, it it could be very much a commentary about machine learning ai also so i think yeah i i think for me what's important is you like meaningfully engage with it rather than letting like a few tech companies in some ways determine the course of how it happen how it shapes our society yeah okay Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. Your art really is incredible. Thank you. And my first question would be about the process that you take. Mm -hmm. In particular, let's say the cube of the gardens. So let's say there are four cubes, and each of them went on a journey of their own to yeah. the same white door. So how much of that was you specifying the stages that each has to go through, of the, or just a starting prompt? So how much is guided and how much is through the AI, which you just accept? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. So I think uh, for me over the years, like what has been central in some ways is the realization or the acceptance of the fact that uh, you can let the system also influence you. Like it, it's a uh, it's a continuum, almost a creative continuum where uh, I mean, in every sort of form of expression, the material talks back to you. Uh, but in AI, I think that uh, talking back happens much more loudly. And I think as an artist, you have to start tuning into that talking back in some ways. Uh, with the gardens work, particularly, I mean, most of the work is actually guided or like uh, guided or actually like strongly, I think, uh, uh, forced in some ways also because there's a certain story I want to tell with the work but there are moments where you let the AI like sort of uh, surprise you and you in include that in your storytelling so yeah with the gardens also the same thing I think there there was a lot of experimentation and also sort of the the movements the animation the camera angles all of that along with the the storytelling there was a very particular story of the four gardens that I wanted to tell. So all of that was, sorry, all of that was very much like um, orchestrated, yeah, to happen that way. Thank you. The second question comes from your curation of an NFT collection. Yeah. So the experience that most of us have from the outside for AI art yeah. was NFTs, which uh, for a large part population seemed unimaginative and uh, the economic value was hard to understand. So how do you think was that maybe misrepresented or, and how much did AI art suffer from that NFT wave? Yeah, I mean, uh, the whole NFT wave is an interesting topic of discussion. I think uh, it really got like, uh, like the conversation really got uh, diluted with all the hype around the finances and the cryptocurrencies involved, etc. I think uh, at its core, like the technology of uh, provenance on a blockchain for a digital piece of artwork, I think that's still pretty solid. And uh, if it had remained around that framework, I think NFTs, uh, I mean, they're still, they're still in existence and they'll continue to be because I still think that they're really good as a mechanism to solve the problem of like provenance in digital art. Uh, but yeah, I think that conversation got very like convoluted with the whole uh, finances involved. Um, and maybe for the AI art space also, I think, uh, yeah, around that same time, there was the whole generative AI hype kind of happening. So I think a lot of things like just 
muddled up in some ways but but i think still like it's really important to uh, to engage with ai from that sort of lens of criticality i think that is the core like framework instead of like getting lost in all these like noise kind of things that keep happening around it uh, just a follow up on that so then came the generative ai revolution and the problem which you would have seen in the community itself was how many artists are opposed to it from the start because of where the data sets come from yeah and that is something that you can't disregard as noise either because it's of a course. very real concern so yes as on the intersection you'll probably have problems from both sides so how do you deal with that yeah i mean my i think take on ai art comes from a very different lens like the works that i've shown i think it's really about uh, like getting very intimate with what constitutes the ai and really like you know crafting the data sets myself crafting the algorithms myself and like using that as a way to to then uh, create art from um and i mean not to obviously disregard all the problematic things around the generative ai uh, framework that we are seeing and i think it really is the burden of the creators of those systems to ensure that uh, all the artists whose data that they've scraped etc get the right credit due etc uh, but uh, but yeah i mean it is at the same time also unlocking uh, the ability to create for a lot of people like we saw with untool also right so um so i think that balance is i think we're in that space where that balance will kind of iron out over time uh, but but it definitely is is important to make sure that the artists uh, uh, don't like get taken for granted in some sense with their data yeah. thank you So there were two parts in most of your art forms, right? One is the art itself, and yeah. then the message or the communication or the question that you were asking, right? And uh, this ties in also with the earlier um, remark and your response as well, which is you could technically be using the AI tools to generate the art form and focus on the question or just or or so I was curious about as an engineer myself, I was curious about how much of engineering went into, let's say, when you had that image changing into different sort of um, uh, forms, right? So the, 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 the painting process itself, I don't remember the mm -hmm. art form. The, Did you yeah. hand code all of these transitions? Did you use another AI uh, generation tool for that? Maybe that time, perhaps they, they didn't exist. I was curious about how do you sort of yeah, look yeah. at using these tools for the art forms itself? Yeah, yeah, no, great question. So uh, I, I think, yeah, like, especially with that work, like, I think often like the inquiry for me is from both the angles, like, the technical angle and the art angle, uh, the storytelling or the messaging and uh, the actual creation process are all in the service of the final artwork. Like, so basically to say that if either of them don't happen, like the artwork won't happen uh, in the sense that uh, the process itself very much encapsulates the output or the aesthetic that I want to get to. So. If it want if, if it wasn't for the process, that particular work would look very different, and it wouldn't like bring out the same like uh, story that I want to bring out from it. So it it's not like a separable like entity in that sense. So the experiments with that in terms of the diff, I think you're referring to the compositional versus the painterly work. So uh, with that, like if if I didn't play around with the learning rate of the GAN training system then the output wouldn't have reflected at least for me wouldn't have captured the essence of what i wanted to capture so i think it it's like saying that uh yeah if you're like doing some work with clay right you don't you you can instead like just design the form and 3d print it right that is another way of doing it and the output might visually whatever like feel the same but i think the process itself captures the actual like uh aesthetics that you want to get to. So it becomes really important for me personally, at least to work with 
uh, some of the engineering aspects of machine learning AI also. So, but do you begin with the question and say, what would a modern painting look like and then try to <clears throat> create? Or do you say, let me play around with the tools and see what questions come up? Both, both. So I always keep playing around with the tools. And sometimes the tools guide the, uh, the actual work. Uh, and often enough, the the actual like story or messaging guides the the work. Um, so, for example, with the one around the beauty filters, right? Like, I obviously have been working with masks over the years, but like, just it started hitting me really strongly with sort of this new beauty filter that came out, right? And I was like, okay, th there is like something that needs to be done in terms of an artwork here uh, and uh, uh, then obviously then sort of the repertoire of tools that I have which are GANs and uh, diffusion models etc to start thinking of okay what would sort of bring that feeling of this slow transition from a traditional mask to this modern day mask in some ways and how can I capture that essence the best so that wouldn't happen if I wouldn't play with the actual tool or the actual algorithms, et cetera, right? So, thank you. Uh, hi, so I'm curious as to, so basically when I saw the dog um, image that was created, hmm. you said that you drew some, hmm. your hmm. interpretation of your drawing was like lines on barren land. Um, sorry, leafless trees on barren land. Mm -hmm. But when I saw the AI image next to it, I was like, okay, it does look like dogs. And then when you gave me your interpretation, I was like, okay. <laughs> so do you think AI in the future maybe um, has the ability to influence our thoughts, our creativity as humans? I'm curious as to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not in the future. I think it's very much, uh, very much the present reality. I think uh, uh, we definitely get influenced very much by what we see, right? And if we're constantly sort of seeing uh, uh, like conjured up realities or versions of reality, then that sort of becomes our version of the reality. So uh, I think, yeah, like uh, it's very much happening and the realism with which it's happening, I think that is what is in some ways the, the thing we should be most like, uh, uh, thoughtful about and like really like dig into it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think it's already happening that kind of influence. And um, is is there some kind of ethical guidelines or how, how does that kind of work in the field of AI? Yeah, I mean, it's an evolving field. So there's definitely like lots of active work happening in the ethical guidelines and people developing that uh, not enough, very clearly has been done till now also at the pace at which I think AI systems are evolving is far more quick, quicker than like what ethical sort of frameworks are evolving at. So there is definitely a lot of work there. Um, we still see instances. I mean, I think a couple of weeks ago, there was an instance of uh, a black lady in America being uh, arrested uh, for a supposed like crime of uh, carjacking, which she wasn't involved in but uh, a facial recognition system like uh, uh, sort of showed that it was her because of the flaws in the facial recognition system. And so uh, I think, yeah, that happened like as recently as a couple of weeks ago, right? So it's very clearly, even though we've been speaking about this, it's clearly not like reflected uh, deeply enough in the actual systems that we are already deploying. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hello, uh, good evening. Uh, just wanted to know, uh, what is your thought about uh, AI after um, AI and uh, abstract art with AI five years and 10 years uh, down the line? Uh, it's a very tough question because how quickly things are changing in the AI space. Um, I mean, I think art, uh, the question of what art will be, etc. I think uh, it really feels like all forms of art obviously can and will continue to exist. It really depends on uh, what 
people want to create and uh, it will definitely unlock a lot more people to find a new way of expression which i think is great um a lot more people will be able to uh, visually communicate and create stuff that they probably were not or were eliminated from the existing set of tools so um in some ways like there's this framework that i think of uh, like tools over techniques for that kind of work right where uh, like the techniques of a person should never become a limiting factor for their ability to creatively express and a lot of ai tooling allows for that to happen uh, which is great but um, i think art by itself will obviously continue to evolve and find newer like uh, questions to ask which art has always done so really tough to predict what exactly would happen in terms of art over the five, next 5 10 years but there'll be all kinds of new fascinating forms of art i think yeah and one thing that uh, i mean uh, is in uh, in terms of writing uh, when i was uh, with an ad agency mm -hmm. uh, i was creating uh, i was crafting uh, the words or the uh, sentences but now, when I use, suppose, any chat GPT or any other AI tools, I don't get that much of satisfaction. I don't know why. So mm -hmm. uh, could you please explain why this is actually happening? Or is there it's any? A, it's good, sir, that that is happening, I think. Uh, so that uh, I think, yeah, you can. Why that is happening is, I mean, I could give a generic answer is maybe because it's sort of a general collection of texts and what it produces maybe doesn't like cut across to you um, uh, because that is what it's best at doing. Um, uh, so I think it, yeah, like these systems become good enablers in certain fields, but it really is up to us to make meaning out of it or make like what we want to make out of it. So maybe they can help you like unlock your, uh, writing block at some point but uh, but then how you sort of take that journey forward becomes like your journey to to go on basically thank you thank you sir hi harshit thank you for your presentation um my question goes back to what you said about paint and painting as as medium and then you know you equated it to data and algorithms. Mm -hmm. Now, paint and paintbrushes are relatively tame compared to data and algorithms. Even going back to that example that you just used, it's because data is primarily white centric. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in how you deal with that as a person situated very much in India and as a person who's using quite a bit of these data sets. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you if, if in that, looked at that lens, is the medium really tame? Is the medium really um, as inert as some people claim it to mm -hmm. be? Hmm. No, it's definitely not. I think I think that's what uh, in sort of uh, an earlier response to think of this material definitely from a material that talks back much more loudly and therefore uh, also as as artists, creatives, maybe creating that space for that conversation to happen and uh, respond to sort of that talking back and and obviously there's no like inherent agency in the material so to say right so it really depends if you're listening enough you can sort of course correct uh, the way you want to course correct because uh, you you kind of like uh, have that as a decision making parameter always uh, but uh, at the same time uh, it becomes really important i think um, that's why to start engaging with that like core material to start trying to form some kind of a relationship for yourself like okay what happens if this becomes part of the data set how much of a certain kind of data is needed to like create a certain kind of visual outcome etc like i think all of that become a new practice by itself um and i think that's important um uh but at the same time yeah like uh, if if the outcomes uh, become something that really don't like add up to your core values i think and there, there may be instances where you're not able to sort of course correct, then you sort of take a call to not like let that work go out, right? So I think it becomes really important to be able to make those decisions more mindfully uh, rather than, because like, yeah, real, like real stuff is at stake in some ways, like with the example of uh, facial recognition technologies, uh, 
and other such technologies, right? So I think, yeah, that is like the, the journey that we have to in some ways collectively go on, yeah. Thank you.